jet lagged and lame, so I hope this goes well. I was a lame duck last year, now I'm just plain lame. This is not going to be a digital presentation. These are just uh, Ed memoir for me to uh, not wander too far off topic. And I have only a half an hour to do what I need to do. And I have a vast topic made vaster by the, uh, the title of this uh, symposium and the exhibition, What About Art? That gives you lots of room for maneuver. Um, maneuvering is indeed what a lot of us do. I am just coming back from Brazil. Uh, where I've spent three weeks installing an exhibition of Brazilian art where it was made as a person from outside looking in. Um, never before have so many people traveled to so many places to see the same things. And of course, encumbered, encountered the same people looking at those things. Uh, and yet, in fact, the art doesn't look the same in all of those places, and it isn't the same. It doesn't feel the same. Its disposition and the culture is different and so on. So I'm going to, with respect to Mr. Tan, I don't want to uh, insult his title, uh, to differ, even though I'm a globetrotter, I do not believe in globalism. Quite the contrary. I do not think that there is a global culture. I think there is a cosmopolitan culture. I think we share it in unequal amounts as we move around, and we experience it differently each time we encounter it. Um, my recent trip to Brazil is a, a good case. Um, I think I ran into half a dozen people, probably auditioning to be the next director of the next uh, Biennale in um, Sao Paulo. Um, and uh, I was interested in how uh, differently they behaved in that context, uh, and how differently the Venice, excuse me, the Sao Paulo Biennale is from the Venice Biennale. I was involved in doing a Bruce Nauman show in the Sao Paulo Biennale that Paul Herkenhoff organized, and when I went back there to look at it this time, it looked to me like a different show, and I count that as a good thing. Um, I think actually we use a language that tends to homogenize, level, and basically turn our senses off um, by using mega words by using huge sociologically and historical concepts uh, to describe quite specific made things made in quite specific contexts by quite specific people that of course mean different things to different individuals over different periods of time in different contexts. Anyway, this summer I have been globe dragging a good deal. Um, I began in Thessaloniki, which is a Greek city, the second largest Greek city, which was a microcosm of its generation of cultural marbling, since it was a meeting place on the Silk Road. Um, and then in Athens, where the Stavros Foundation uh, just opened, a magnificent building by uh, Renzo Piano, which is a very interesting experiment in cultural philanthropy. It's the first time that a national museum, actually a national library, and a the national theater have been paid for by, entirely paid for by private sources. And for this project, I um, gathered together a team for the second year in a row, uh, Barbara Hoff, uh, Barbara um, London, excuse me, from MoMA, Calliope Aminodaki, a Greek a student of mine from the IFA, and Francesco Petropalo, with whom I worked on the Venice BI. And we made a survey of international video art for a general public that would wander into the garden, see these things from dusk until dawn on screens scratted around in a variety of places. Yang Kudong was in the show, for, for example. Um, and where you, again, you, you, you shift the audience from the art audience, per se, to a self-selecting, meandering, uncertain general audience and see what happens. And what happens is often quite remarkable. From there I went to Prague, Munich, Dusseldorf, Cologne, Paris, where I saw a size installation at the Cartier Foundation about which I'll have more to say in a minute. Um, let me see how we do this. Scrolling. I'm, I'm digitally challenged. I'm challenged in all kinds of departments. Um, anyway, um, and then uh, followed on down to Brazil to make this show. Now, interestingly, the show itself, as I said, was a show of Brazilian art, but the venue was actually a venue for Brazilian art, named after a famous Brazilian artist named Tomi Otake. Um, Tomi Otake was a, a, a painter of the generation of the 60s, and uh, the collection was the collection of Josie Olimpio and An Andrea Pereira, and they chose this institution to show their collection. And uh, it's indicative of the marbling that I think is important to understand when we look at Brazil. Um, I'm always troubled when people talk about America as this country. Um, we are the Americas, plural, uh, from Tierra del Fuego to Baffin Bay. That includes Canada. They're the Americas, too. My wife is Canadian. She reminds me that they're very different Americans from us Americans here. 
um, and that uh, the Americas is the place where the world came together for all kinds of reasons and marbled in ways that have never happened anywhere since or before, even though the ancient world around the Mediterranean is something of a paradigm. Um, and that marbling was by virtue of conquest, by virtue of trade, by virtue of uh, immigration forced and unforced, uh, it has everything to do with the kind of processes that we are now seeing active in the world today. Uh, and it makes us, if we look at it carefully, think very carefully about the generalizations we make about cultural hybridities. Because again, if choice is in one case an issue, coercion another, hope is one, despair is another, and so on and so forth, and if the populations are as diverse as they actually are in this hemisphere, um, so that there are a million first, second, and third generation, fourth generation Japanese in Sao Paulo, they form more than 10% of the population. Uh, Tomiotaki was of that generation. She came from Japan, but then her son, Ryuotaki, is a noted Japanese architect, Japanese-Brazilian architect, who designed the Instituto, and his brother, um, who is my host, Ricardo, with a good Spanish or Brazilian name, um, managed it. Um, so that we are talking about a situation where one thing does not mean the same thing in all places because the contexts are, in fact, layered to an enormous degree. Um, if you go to uh, Mexico, for example, there's a large Chinese population, much of it uh, left over from the migrations out of the United States after the forced immigration, or virtually forced immigration, uh, from the building of the railroad. So if you think about Latin America, which shouldn't be called that at all, it's simply South America, um, it is not any more Latin than we are Anglo. If you think about Latin America, all these different populations mix in unequal ways throughout. You have indigenous populations, dozens and dozens and dozens of indigenous populations mixing, also by conquest, also by osmosis. Um, and then all these immigrations. There are more Italians uh, in, uh, in, in Buenos Aires than there are in any other place in the world, I think, other than Italy. Um, so we are now in a world where globalism, again, boils down, homogenizes, creates this impression of one thing uh, where one could conceivably make one-size-fits-all art. But in fact, we are dealing with places where reception as well as production is modulated by all of these histories. And you can't just discuss history with a capital H. You have to learn specific histories to talk about art in specific places which is one of the reasons I think that Asia Society and all the efforts of the Rockefeller family to uh, promulgate an understanding of the Americas, of Asia, and other parts of the world was largely positive. You can say it was all a capitalist conspiratorial plot, it probably was, but um, it was an intelligent one. Uh, and it was uh, to the benefit of many, many people not directly involved with the conspiracies uh, pointed out by the people who point out conspiracies. Now, um, all I'm trying to say is that this is, this, is, this is the art world that interests me, the art world of institutions rather than of the market. There's been discussion in the film we just saw about the, the market, yet the market is the first thing you see in the film and the last thing we hear about often in conversations on this circuit. But in reality, there are many philanthropic or quasi-philanthropic institutions where art is shown and art in all of its various varieties. And those are the places where I think more of us should be committed to doing our work and we should do it indifferent to the other factors to the extent that that's at all possible. Some of the art that is made in this sort of polymorphous hybrid world is bad. In fact, quite a lot of it is bad. Um, much of it is very, very good, and even the mediocre stuff is interesting if you look at it uh, in terms of cultural production rather than of, in terms of some kind of idealized art history. Now, the discourses that I have critiqued and critiqued over and over and over again in my writing have had their uses, but they have also had their detrimental effects. And I won't go into my usual rant on this subject, except to say that I really wish people would set aside all of the big words they use and just stop using them. Um, uh, Ezra Pound said, you know, that the job of poets is to keep the language efficient. I think the job of critics is to keep the language efficient. I think finding a voice as a critic doesn't mean finding your own personal voice. It means speaking as a person to some other person about who, to whom you wish to communicate information. And the more meta your discourse is, the less likely that is to happen. So I would say maybe it's time for the people who promote the idea of cultural diversity to actually practice it in ways that turn out the authoritarian use of certain kinds of culturally conditioned language. Now let me pivot to use an election period uh, word to Saigo Kyung. 
Um, he is among the survivors in a raft of artists coming out of China that were introduced in a series of exhibitions and particularly in one blast, not all of them, and he was not among the ones who were chosen, by Harold Zeman uh, in the Aperto, Apertuto of 1995-2000. 1999-2000 in the, in the uh, Venice Biennale. And there was a group of 20 artists that he brought forward in that one exhibition which broke the barriers. Much as in the Russian situation, it was the Sotheby's auction that sort of popularized the idea of a, a, a Russian art world. So uh, Harry did, he, Harry heralded them, H-A-R-L, um, the, the advent of Chinese art in, in the West. And it had all the problems that such things have, but it also had the benefit of just fielding a lot of artists that people didn't know. And the task of institutions and of individuals involved in this field is to sort, add, qualify, critique, and so on, uh, and to just give him credit for what he did, much as um, Jean-Hubert Martin in Les Magiciens de la Mon uh, du Monde uh, institutionalized a certain number of artists from outside the Western canon, and then was beaten up for generations after that you know, because he uh, westernized Africa. Um, I know him and I kind of disagree with him on a lot of things, but I like him a great deal. And I'm beginning to see that uh, people who were former his critics are beginning to say thank you very much for doing that after all. Now anyway, um, let me just say that uh, Sai belongs to this generation of Chinese artists that have come at the project uh, with a huge sense of showmanship. Showmanship being one of the characteristics of the Chinese art world. I think it's one of the problematic aspects of it, frankly, but I think it also is responsible for breaking down barriers in a lot of different directions, and there is no one who does it better than Sai. Um, we, all of us of a certain generation, read Guy Debord's Society of Spectacle, and all of us be, learned to be distrustful of spectacles, and then we immediately threw ourselves into them um, and produced them and uh, went to them and so on and so forth. I think Guy Debord's principal criticism is that spectacle makes the viewer passive and that the active viewer is what you want. And I think one can now sort of come away from the Puritanism of first-generation Debordians, who hated all spectacles, again, even though they went to them, um, to, to uh, say that the question is what spectacles activate viewers and what spectacles simply uh, blund, uh, sort of um, beat them into submission. Um, and Saigo Kang's work, is a scene, I think, is a case of the one that does absolutely engage and pressurize the viewer to think and act differently in the context of the work. Um, you can say, for instance, that the pyrotechnic aspect of his work is the simplest version of this. Uh, if you think of what the Gucci brothers do every time they shoot off their fireworks for the 4th of July, or what Peter Sheldahl, as a sort of uh, outsider artist of fireworks, has done in Bovina, New York, uh, you will say that this is, the, this, is the, this is the sort of Big Bang theory, right? And there's not much more to do than to say, wow, check out the firepower. Um, it seems to me that Sayo Kang's work is informed very much by Chinese painting, very much by a sense of what the materiality of fireworks really is. He understands them. And he's able to make perfectly beautiful things of the briefest possible duration. And when they're of long duration, they're simply that thing over and over again, very modulated like a piece of music, in space, in time, and then gone. Absolutely. There is no residue of that other than your visual memory and your auditory memory of the piece. Um, but it seems to me that in doing this and in exploring this territory and in uh, exploring territory of scale in time as well as in space, uh, he's raised a whole series of very interesting issues that are there to be explored by others. In the film, there was a discussion about whether there was a formalism in Chinese art. I would say that Sai actually is a formalist, um, and I think that the formalism of his work is the most interesting aspect of it. Uh, and he raises a number of uh, important issues about this kind of spectacular form, how one understands these pressures, the dialectic of space and time, at, at, when, when both are grand, right? Mm -hmm. and, and how does one absorb it, how does one experience it, and how does one understand the world differently in light of it? Now, and there's an old art school adage, which if you can't make it good, make it big. Uh, and that's something I always teach my students, be careful of that. But there's some people who actually know how to make it big. The people who produce Aida in Rome in the Baths of Caracalla, and Sai is another one. Okay. Now, um, I'm going to talk about one work and then get out of the way of the rest of the conversation. And that work is White Tone, which is a, uh, to my knowledge, so far unique example of where he has used the pyrotechnic effects of his work that in sort of um, res responds, if you will, to Chinese screen painting to do something figurative, to do something symbolic, to do something allegorical. 
if I'm not mistaken, it was actually commissioned by the Cartier Foundation for an exhibition called the Great Animal Orchestra. I believe that it is now owned by the Cartier Foundation, and I should know since I am on their acquisitions committee, and I know we discussed it. Um, so uh, if it isn't yet, uh, sorry, I think you can rest assured that something will happen. Um, and I hope Cartier is not here um, in case I've blown the, um, the intention. But anyway, that piece... Um, that piece is unique to the extent that it represents something and that he laid it out so that the effects of the explosions would draw an image rather than create a set of spatial relationships. Um, and what it is is a variation in present day of uh, Edward Hicks's Peaceable Kingdom, which are a series of primitive paintings made by an American 18th century painter, 19th century painter, of all the animals in perfect divine harmony living together, the lion with the lamb. Um, in this particular case, it is a whole group of animals gathered around one common watering hole. And it is a metaphor for the ecological situation which we are in, for the necessity of toleration and of living together for survival purposes. Uh, and it is part of a larger exhibition which uh, Artnet called uh, one of the most refreshing and uh, uh, best exhibitions of the summer if anybody got to see it. I hope people have seen it. I don't think it's going to travel. It's remarkable. For example, among the other things that were in it was a series of uh, films taken, of birds of paradise flashing their feathers in some of the most exotic ways you can think of, and yet it's about camouflage. It's about how physical beauty, how physical display is a form of protection. Uh, I think anybody who goes to parties dressed up probably knows that already. Um, on the film Coming Home, I saw the Iris uh, Apfel film, the uh, last film that uh, Albert Maisley made, and it's about a woman who made a lifetime of dressing up to protect herself. Um, in any case, uh, there are other things in it, uh, some of them explicitly uh, ecological. Among the most interesting are a series of soundscapes made by Bernie Krauss, who is 77 years old and has recorded 15,000 types of living creatures. Uh, and he has combined these in varieties of different ways to create a kind of uh, visual soundscape and they've done it uh, on the walls where you see the raising and lowering of levels as you would see in them in a, a sound lab. Uh, and then uh, you see the color tones of what the things actually are. And you hear whales and you hear all sorts of critters that I don't even know made noises, um, but they do. Um, I hope they're not farting, but whatever they're doing, they're making some kind of an aquatic noise. And there are signs of life. It's worth mentioning that Bernie Krauss, who's been doing this for many, many, many years, has noticed that the number of noises in jungles has diminished. And as we lose species, we lose the sort of vital noise that is the noise of the world. And that is what the show is really about. Now, I would just go back to uh, Sai's contribution to this and say that Sai's contribution to this is another, if you will, parable of the same phenomenon. How is coexistence predicated on uh, the actual scarcity of resources. Uh, if we can't just get along, to quote a famous uh, statement made during civil strife in Los Angeles, if we can't get along, we will perish. We all know this. Uh, we are now facing around Europe, around this country, and all over the world, uh, people who are absolutely adamant about the idea that we should keep ourselves segregated according to species or race, or ethnicity. And that is doom, and we all know it. And yet, somehow or other, the arguments against that have not reached the people who are most afraid, actually, of being uh, excluded from the world by somebody else, as a result of which they will be excluded from the world, as will everybody else, by this sort of massive um, paranoid behavior. Um, anyway, globalism is part of that context, right? What we do not want is a global power. What we do not want is a global regime. What we do not want is anything that generalizes difference away. What we want is difference that can tolerate other differences. And what this particular piece by Sai does is it emblematizes that idea. And there are other people engaged in that. So I would simply conclude by saying, uh, where is the art? Well, it's in many places, and much of the art is not about these big issues, uh, and it is certainly better when it is about these big issues if it does not use big language to describe it, if it simply describes it. But in the case of this, I will simply keynote two words, cosmopolitanism and hybridity. We are all hybrid. The question is, are we all cosmopolitan? Thank you.
Thank you, Rob, for that great beginning. I think it uh, is a great foundation for the discussions ahead and gave everybody a lot to think about. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michelle Yun. I'm the Senior Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at Asia Society. And it's my pleasure to welcome the first panel of um, the afternoon. Uh, this panel will discuss the methodologies behind artistic practices of two leading artists today, Tsai Bo Chang, uh, who we've heard a little bit from already this afternoon, and Anne Hamilton. And the panel will be moderated by Joaquin Pissarro. Our first speaker, Tsai Bo Chang, was born in Trenzo City, China in 1957, and now lives in New York. Over the past 30 years, Tsai's art has left its mark in various cultural spheres across five continents. His retrospective exhibition at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in 2008 drew over 350,000 viewers, breaking the museum's attendance records of visual artists, art, of, sorry, of visual art exhibitions um, for the museum. Tai Guo Chang Peasants Da Vinci's made its debut at the Rockbund Art Museum in Shanghai and subsequently toured in three cities in Brazil in 2013, attracting over a million visitors in total. Tsai was also the curator of the first China Pavilion at the 51st Venice Biennale in 2005 and has served as director of visual and special effects for the opening and closing ceremonies of the 2008 Be Olympics in Beijing. Some of his notable projects in recent years include solo exhibitions Sarab at the Mataf Arab Art Museum of Modern Art in Doha and 10,040 meters underground in Donetsk, Ukraine, also in 2011. He's also conducted explosion events uh, entitled One Night Stand in Paris and Sky Ladder in Trenzo, China in 2015. In 2016, he curated What About the Art? Contemporary Art from China at the Qatar Museums in Doha, the ideas from which this symposium originated. Tsai was awarded the Golden Lion at the, 19, uh, at the 48th Venice Biennale in 1999 and the Premium International for, the, for Painting in 2012. He was among the five artists honored for the first U.S. Department of State Medal of Arts Award in 2012 as well. Tsai has recently been awarded the Barnett and Annalie Newman Foundation Award in 2015 and the Bonfantin Award for Contemporary Art and most recently for us, uh, our Asia Society Asia Arts Award in 2016. Tsai will be followed uh, from his presentation by a presentation by Anne Hamilton. Anne Hamilton is a visual artist internationally acclaimed for her large-scale multimedia installations, public projects, and performance collaborations. Her site-responsive process works with common materials invoke particular places, collective voices, and communi communities of labor. Hamilton has received the National Medal of Arts Award, MacArthur Fellowship, the Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, NEA Visual Arts Fellowship, the United States Arts Artist Fellowship, the Heinz Award, and was selected to represent the United States in the 1991 Sao Paulo Biennale and the 1999 Venice Biennale. She received a BFA in textile design from the University of Kansas in 1979 and an MFA in sculpture from the Yale University School of Art in 1985. Hamilton currently lives in Columbus, Ohio, where she's the Distinguished University Professor of Art at The Ohio State University. Beginning Saturday, September 17th, the Fabric Workshop and Museum will present Habitus, a new large-scale installation in two locations in Philadelphia. And our moderator for this panel will be Joaquim Pissarro. Dr. Pissarro is an art historian, theoretician, educator, and director of the Hunter College, um, sorry, the Hunter College Art Galleries and the Brashad Professor of Art History at Hunter College of the City of New York. Dr. Pissarro has been the editorial director of the Wildenstein Publication in America since 2002 and was curator in MoMA's Department of Painting and Sculpture from 2003 to 2007. Dr. Pissarro's teaching and writing presently focus on the challenge, challenges facing art history due to the 
unprecedented proliferation of artworks, images, and visual data. He's co-authored a book on this topic with David Carrier, who's also here today, entitled Wild Art. And in the same vein, he's also taught a seminar on Michael Jackson entitled Michael Jackson, the Contemporary Representation of a Cultural Icon. Other recent writings by Dr. Pissarro include the book Individualism and Intersubjectivity in Modernism, two case studies of artistic interchanges of Camille Pissarro and Paul Cezanne, Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming um, these esteemed panelists to the stage. You are second. <laughs> I'm first. <laughs> okay. I have one. Yes. Robert, I'm not Like Robert, um, I'm not good at con- le- technology and computers. And oftentimes, when I start using it, it stops working. <laughs> I prepared a presentation of 10 or so minutes long. But then I was told that today simultaneous translation may not be possible. So later on, <laughs> so later on, I will just ask Sang, the project man- director at a Thai studio, to read my script here. <laughs> um, she was planning to do simultaneous translation, but since uh, we don't have the time and no uh, technology here, then we will. Uh, she will just read the script. The exhibition What About the Art in Doha was a question I raised as the curator because I felt that in a lot of um, events and discussions about art, social issues, and buzzwords often take the spotlight away from the examination of art. While an artist's social responsibility and subjects such like politics are definitely important, it is equally important to pay attention to concerns surrounding the artworks themselves and the artist's realization of them. I thank Shan Shan, the director of the documentary film that you just watched. She managed to fully capture my curatorial concept of the exhibition and also those artists' works. So um, here today, I won't elaborate on the contents of the exhibition. But I have to confess that um, just now when I was sitting here watching the film, I was a bit uncomfortable while um, thinking that, well, as a curator, I was really that aggressive. <laughs> there are many curators sitting here who once curated my exhibition, including Nancy Sandra Morrow, Sandra Morrow, and Sandra Morrow. They never asked me this question. What about your art? <laughs> and of course, my gratitude goes to Asia Society for hosting this symposium. And of course, my gratitude goes to the six distinguished speakers for participating. So I want to say Oh, 
So there's the whole system. Okay, that has to be so here I just want to say, oh, that Cai Guoxiang, your art for music, how is it? Now I will have to ask. <laughs> so Cai, what about your art? <laughs> But this, actually, I can't explain. But in fact, um, it's hard for me to articulate it. This、um, my answer. But I did prepare. But I did prepare and take make full use of this opportunity. Try to get myself a cross. But I did prepare and take make full use of this opportunity. Try to get myself a cross. But I did prepare and take make full use of this opportunity. Try to get myself a cross. But I did prepare and take make full use of this opportunity. Try to get myself a cross. But I did prepare and take make full use of this opportunity. Try to get myself a cross. So now it's Sam, your turn, and then、uh, it's my turn to work for you. 对，你完全可以练得快一点。我发现发现英语说的很快。And Sam, you have to read fast because I realized English speakers speak fast.、Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, I will start. <laughs> Public attention to my art often goes no further than my cultural identity and the background of my upbringing, as well as the visual spectacle in my work. Well, in fact, on a parallel track, I've been so persistent and concerned about exploring my artistic language, which is especially interesting and worthy of discussion. Reporters asked me, "Are you a Chinese artist, an Asian artist, international artist, contemporary artist, an artist?" My answer to all of these was yes. I am indeed from China, but I also lived and worked in Japan for over eight years, and in the U.S. for more than two decades. I grew with different cultures of the world, but ultimately, all this goes back to the subject: me as an artist. Venice Ren,、uh, Venice Ren Collection Courtyard at the Venice Biennale in 1995 is a classic example of drawing from Chinese subject matter that is politically relevant to China. As a result, there was also a strong critical response within China. I invited the original sculptors from China, turn the Went on Biennale exhibition space into their studio, and asked them to reproduce the classic socialist sculpture Rand Collection Courtyard in front of the live audiences. This made use of cultural ready-mades, allowing a classic work from art history to interpret a concept, contemporary concept. The artists become the subject of the piece; their fates within time become the theme of the work. I also tried through performance to bring traditional sculpting techniques back to the Biennale, where sculptures as an art form had been missing from the picture for a while. This is Hadang, that was first created for my solo exhibition at the Deutsche Guggenheim Museum. The inspiration came from the fall of the Berlin Wall. I wanted to show that while visible walls are easy to dismantle, the intangible wall between individuals or different cultures are difficult to erase. Ninety-nine wolves crash into a transparent glass wall, which is exactly the same height as the Berlin Wall. It seems they repeat the same path over and over, as if projecting the human tendency to blindly follow others. Here, I borrow from the form of the Eastern traditional scroll painting, as well as the time-space concept behind multipoint perspective, injecting a sense of movement and temporality into static installation. This is different from the window-like traditional Western painting, which can be absorbed by the viewer with one look. Rather, Hadang is like a scroll, a scroll painting, unfolding under the viewer's eye as they move through different parts, creating a sense of reading a painting. This is the installation heritage. You want to go back? Ah. 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 Now this is the installation heritage. Oh, you said so fast. Ninety-nine animals. <laughs> He was blaming me for speaking too slowly, so now、okay. we'll get faster. Yeah. This is installation heritage. Ninety-nine animals, both tame and aggressive, lower their heads humbly together to drink from the same pond. It seems a metaphor of the cruel reality of the human environment. If such a beautiful utopian thing can only be realized by the past. Last pool of clean water on Earth. Then it is a heritage that we have no desire to inherit. The setting of the piece is like a fairy tale. It crosses the boundaries between ages and cultures. It directly assails the viewer's sensibilities, moving them to tears. I use the animals to tell a story about human beings. When I was young and in China, paintings of people were often tools for propaganda. This has made me refrain from directly using images of people in my works. I also feel obliged to say something about gunpowder, which I use extensively. Objectively speaking, the Chinese invented gunpowder, but its violence has already been seen and felt all over the world. And fireworks used for celebration are almost cliché. However, for example, 
I designed and helped the technology to realize the particular shape of fireworks for footprints of history. The footprints marched 15 kilometers along the central axis of Beijing, one step after another in the sky, representing the historic moment when the Asian civilization and the rest of the world would approach each other and meet. This allowed tens of thousands of people to be able to witness and thus participate in the ceremony from across the city, and is therefore also an artist's individual piece in the midst of a national event. Peter Marzio, the late former director of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, once commented, I was treating the country as a work of art. Here, people often only see the negative sides of artists collaborating with nations. In this case, the artist's hard work did indeed help with the country's modernity, internationality, as well as artistry. In other words, making it more open and universal. This idea originated from the series Projects for Extraterrestrials, which I initiated in Japan in the late 80s and early 90s. It aimed to disregard the binary of Eastern culture versus Western culture, looking at human civilization on Earth with the perspective of aliens, and exploring the relationships between people and universe, as well as people and nature. This is projects to extend the Great Wall of China by 10,000 meters. At the end point of Great Wall, the light and fire of explosion extended into the Gobi Desert for 10,000 meters in the searing flames. The Great Wall, which had been silent for thousands of years, was brought back to life. A confusion of space and time was created in the desert. I understood that no matter the scale of your artwork, it is limited in its own power. But if you manage to connect time and space in a single moment, letting the limited artwork borrow from the limitless power of history and nature, then the power of the piece becomes unlimited. This is the methodology that I seek, as well as the shared concept behind all of my works. Before execution, the team and the participants drank a cup of herbal tea that could help boost courage and invigorate their body. After the explosion, they drank another kind that could calm their spirit. The local herbs were also an important part of this project. The mushroom cloud series that were realized when I first arrived in the US, like the Great Wall Project just now, also borrowed strengths from history. The sites for the series include the Nevada nuclear test site, Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty, and New York City. This is one night stand in Paris. At midnight, by the stretch of River Seine between Museum Louvre and Museum d'Orsay, I invited 15, 50 couples from all over the world to enjoy a 12-minute fireworks explosion from a sightseeing boat. 12 minutes is said to be the average duration of intercourse in France. <laughs> it started with letter fireworks that spelled, one night stand, let's play, followed by fireworks that mimicked the lovemaking process from foreplay, climax, to aftertaste. Afterwards, the couples entered individual tents to improvise. The artwork was then turned over to the hands of these lovers. If they like, they could keep on the lights inside the tent so that the hundreds of thousands of viewers on both sides of the river could watch the silhouettes of their performance. Um, actually, no lover, not any lover turned off their lights. Yeah. That's what I found. Um, um, after the climax, once they were satisfied, they could press a button inside the tent, which would release spontaneous fireworks from the surrounding small boats. So in front of the two major museums, filled with masterpieces, I wanted to infuse a dose of aphrodisiac into the free and romantic history of French art. Finally, fireworks spelled out, sorry, gotta go, mm -hmm. calling it a night. Even art that is fun requires a method and a methodology. This is Skyladder, a project that I completed in my hometown. At Dang, a 500 meter high and 5.5 meter wide ladder, laden with golden fireworks, was ignited from the bottom up. In the magnificent roar, it was as though a giant golden ladder had been slowly raised from the ground and into the skies to have a conversation with the universe. It was realized far away in a fishing village of my hometown and was dedicated to my 100-year-old grandmother. It is a letter drawn between the earth and the sky, 
It's for the everyman, and it's universal. It strikes people with its simple and straightforward power. Like the, just like the television and internet broadcast of footprints at the Beijing Olympics, which was watched by hundreds of... I forgot to mention that one month after seeing the skyliner, um, Tsai's grandmother passed away. Okay. Just like the television and internet broadcast of footprints at the Beijing Olympics, which was watched by hundreds of millions of people around the world, the resulting video of Skyladder was viewed by 30 million people within two days on Facebook alone. In the, uh, in the internet age, the methods and the speed of communication have grown drastically. This has affected my work and opened new frontiers for more socially conscious work. This was allergy, the daytime explosion event on Huangpu River in Shanghai. I used color gunpowder as the paint and the sky as the canvas to present three moving scroll paintings. Can we show the video, please? And this is also directed by Shan Shan. Okay, I will be faster. <laughs> um, the sky has the canvas to, pre to present three moving scroll paintings, elegy, remembrance, and consolation. The substance interacted and merged with the air pressure and wind speed of the day. That day, once again, I felt that art has truly been my time and space channel through which I can converse with the unseen world and the spirits. I've never really left painting behind. My childhood dream of becoming an artist was actually one of becoming a painter, not about large installations or explosion events. Recently, I've even become a weekend painter, working in the office during the week and painting on the weekends. Also, every once in a while, I aspire to do an exhibition purely for painting because I hope to direct more of my own and other people's attention to my paintings. I'm currently in the talks with the Prado Museum about a solo exhibition of painting. This will also be a continuation of my exploration of painting. Inspired by the spirit and glory of painting found in Prado's collection as a starting point, I wish to seek the spirit of painting of today and that of my own, as well as consider the plight of contemporary painting today. Viewers will see how I have been in conversation with El Graco in spirit since I was young, with his freedom and ease, his pride and his mysteriousness. In 2009, I went on a journey to follow his steps, from his hometown in Crete to Venice, Madrid, and his death place in Toledo. I went to see what he saw from his perspective. There may also be my studies of El Graco's techniques and the spirit behind. The exhibition may also showcase my experimentation with gunpowder materials and painting methods. Because I think, compared with what to paint, those master painters before us were more concerned about craftsmanship, about how to paint. There may also be a series of new black gunpowder and color gunpowder paintings, which feature spirituality and pride as their main themes. I hope to explore the spirit of painting of masters such as Tishan, Velasquez, and Goya through their technique, themes, and sensuality. About the theme of spirituality, for a long time now, I've mainly used black gunpowder. This was part of my pursuit of spirituality and a way to converse with the unseen world. This includes the gunpowder drawings I made for the Explosion Project series, Projects for Extraterrestrials in Early Times. In one of these drawings, the vague border at the edge of time and space project, I stood under the sun and exploded my own shadow onto the canvas. You could say that this was a drawing about my philosophy of art. At the time, I asked myself, in this visible space and time, an invisible non-space and time, is there a chaotic world where space and time are blurred and where souls overlap? If it does exist, where is it? Is it a place where artwork exists? Since my solo exhibition, Primeval Fireball in the 90s, I've also been exploring the possibility of in installation painting. As for the other theme of pride and love, 
In recent years, I've returned to exploring color gunpowder, and this has become a new phase in my painting. When, I th when thinking about painting, I often start by assessing them of three levels. The first is the visual recognition, whether you can identify the artist from the style, technique, or material. Then, whether the painting has the power to penetrate, or whether it has charm. All this has to do with how you paint. The second level has to do with the corresponding contents, including the painting's theme or what you paint. Generally, how you paint and what you paint make up the foundation of painting. The third is the question, the question about painting, or why you paint. This concerns the goals of what your attitude and philosophy towards painting can bring to the discipline. Why you paint might in turn help you contemplate and develop how you paint and what you paint. The, th the themes that I'm working on include sexual desire and hallucination, while aphrodisiac mushrooms and poppies are motives. The contents I explore and the medium I work with being, um, being gunpowder explosions, both have a certain uncontrollability. I'm testing how I can fully release the shared sensual power between myself and the materials. Through a dialogue with old masters, I hope to re release my unrealized childhood dream of becoming a painter. Painting has long and repeatedly been declared dead. So are there even any questions left within painting? If yes, then the spirit of painting may still exist and it will not die. Then what questions do my paintings raise about painting itself? Even if these are questions about human society or the environment, we have to think about how to elevate these into questions about painting itself. Some people might say that these are fake questions. There are no real questions left to ask in painting today. Painting has gone from objective and realistic portrayals to a subjective, subjective vessel through which emotions can be conveyed. Every approach and concept seems to have been done before. Perhaps people, people may also say that it's imp impossible for painting to suit every era. In the internet age, which seems better suited for multimedia, can painting keep up with the changing times and develop new features unique to the present? Or perhaps it's precisely because we are in the internet age that we should cherish and emphasize the glory and dignity inherent in painting all the more. Then, what are the things that should be cherished? If it's the sensuality of the present, then we, we need to create ways of presenting it that differ from those of the past. I've become more and more aware of the difficulties of painting today, yet the more challenging it is, the more excitement I feel, so intense that it can get me high. All the paintings for the Prado exhibition may be created in Hall of Realms in Madrid, once the palace of Philip IV. More than four centuries ago, master painters in Europe were commissioned by Philip IV to compete for art artistic excellency, using these premises as their studio and gallery. My months-long creation here may become a site-specific happening, and the process may be open to the public. Public creation is an artistic method and form of painting creation that I have been developing over years. Recruiting local volunteers to create together, opening the process to live audiences and live broadcasting on television or the internet or smartphones for people to participate and interact with us. Even cab drivers have called in to ask when we will light the fuse. But public creation is not performance art. It's not performance art. Rather, it ties the viewers and artists together as they share the uncertainty and anxiety after lighting the fuse and experiencing the consequence of a small act of fate. Culture emerges, emerges through people. So when local volunteers participate in public creation events, they also bring their own cultures into my paintings. The volunteers are very different from each other and bring a different energy, thus placing the already difficult to control gunpowder in the hands of chance. These public creation events are continuation of borrowing power to exercise power methodology from my use. They are also a reflection of the interactive nature of the internet age and its unique ability to blur the boundary between roles of the subjects and objects. The year of 2017 will see the centennial anniversary of the October Revolution. I'm currently preparing for a solo exhibition at the Pushkin Museum and in the planning stage for the explosion event on Red Square for that same year. For the explosion, I will use gunpowder to recreate Maralevich's iconic black cross and black square.
presenting artwork from a hundred years ago in the blue sky, melding the city and the people into one single painting. This is a tribute to Russian artists, also an expression of my thousands of feelings toward their fate. Looking back, my painting has been traveling between sky and earth. For the drawings created for projects for extraterrestrials, the series of outdoors explosion projects that I began in the late 80s, I used the drawings to realize my time-space explosions. Later, I developed daytime color fireworks, using the sky as a canvas to create poetic portrayals. After that, I began using the color gunpowder from the daytime fireworks on real canvases to create paintings. I then plan to release my exploration of painting as well as my rebellion and reflections on painting into the open sky. Before I get off the stage, 10 years ago, I created Transparent Monument for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I raised a five meter tall piece of transparent glass facing the direction of where the World Trade Center used to stand before September the 11th. In the multidimensional world of reality, the things seen through the glass become two dimensional. The moment a bird hits the glass and falls, time and space seem to change, and chaos seem to arise. Airplanes are unable to cross over to the other side and shatter before the two-dimensional. This piece of glass is like a huge scroll painting that has thrust itself into our epoch. I've been pondering over the hazy yet complicated connotation of this piece. It looks like an installation, but also concerns painting. Such a piece, along with my decades of persistent pursuit of invisible world, is in a sense symbolic of my ambition towards painting, while also an expression of my untainable frustrations toward the things that are difficult to realize in painting, and towards the decline of painting in our time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sai. That was extraordinary. I'm not quite sure how to follow that. Uh, and hello, everyone. Thank you to the Asia Society for hosting us and the discussion. I was born the year the Asia Society was founded, so we share this anniversary. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm a little bit in a dilemma. I know we're short for time. We have 10 minutes. But uh, practice. My practice is actually one of response, of responding to the place, the particular circumstance, the contingencies of where I find myself or where I'm asked to travel and respond to. And um, so I've gathered a few thoughts. Oops, I have, uh, oh yeah, this is on. And um, I just wanted to address then the hand that I carry with me as I, um, find a way to be in the places that I'm in. And I was really struck, Rob, by some of your comments, you know, about um, that every circumstance is different. And certainly one of the things that I have found with my site uh, responsive installations is that they actually don't travel very well. The, 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 the vocabulary may travel, the practice may travel, um, what size calling may be methodology, but in fact, um, everything is live, and it's such a, a particular response to the circumstances of place, of time, of people, of architecture, of the weather, of what is in the news, what I'm reading, and it's the intersection of those that make the work. So uh, the invitation to be here today, I'm going to need my glasses here, um, is to think about uh, how art happens. And I think for me, it's always an act of recognition. It's an act of attention that brings something to recognition that is particular to a specific circumstance. Where does work come from? What are the conditions that allow it to happen? How are we invited in? How can we become a we across all of our differences? 
And what are the circumstances that allow that to happen? And how does art participate in that? And those are my questions. So for me, the process is always one of finding. Finding what something needs to be. Finding, um, finding the question that needs asking and the form for embodying that question. So it's a movement across, and like the birds, perchings and flyings that William James describes as a stream of consciousness, the work happens between the landings down, and each flight is different. We work from what we have, our hands, our embodied selves, our capacity for language, for feeling. We think through feeling. The reelings out and the reelings in are the flights, and that is how the work is made. So, let's see, how do I do this one? <laughs> let's see. Yeah. So my first hand is a sewing hand. The under over, the in and out, the stitch joining two things into one thing. A needle pokes down through a cloth, pulls a thread with it, descends into the invisible space that is underneath, the underside. And then, it's an act of faith, the thread pokes back up through and pulls up to the surface that same thread. And in some instances, something unexpected is also drawn up from that faraway place that is the underneath of the cloth. And it's that unexpected part drawn to the surface that is the making, is the bird's flight, is the thinking, is the finding that is the attention that becomes the art. My hands are busy, the mind can wander. And if it is a looped structure, as in a knitted structure, one loop pulls into another until a membrane of many loops is made, and this is the social fabric. Each act of making is a possibility. Each act of unmaking is something that our making needs to address so that we can make the larger cloth. The, red, the thread used for sewing or knitting might also pull from the mouth a line of yarn, a line of sound, a line of speech, the possibility of making. Text and textile in English share the first four letters. I don't know in other languages if that is true. Becomes the line of writing when a book is wound into a ball, a flat page becomes a round body. The words become embodied through the hands, become a text read at the pace, oops. Could you poke it so it starts? Let's see. Can you get the video to play? Oh, it is going, okay. Uh, becomes a text, ray. we're all challenged by technology <laughs> and vision <laughs> and our knees. No. Um, becomes a text read at the pace of the hand and the eye moving. How can the solitary act of reading, which changes each of us in different ways, become some collectively shared process? How does a line of reading um, become a material act when our reading proceeds at the pace of the ink pooling, of the pen scratching the surface, of leading, leaving a material trace that are our words and our marks in the world? Sorry, this one is for you. <laughs> Maybe turn it down a little bit. So uh, I just wanted to tell a little story, is that when I was uh, applying to graduate school, which now seems eons ago, and I was in an interview, 
uh, in the sculpture department at Yale, and I was asked, um, you don't do this weaving thing anymore, do you? <laughs> Rather leading question, full of uh, presumptions and judgments, and I was shy in my response. I just sort of, I think, pursed my lips. And... Um, it was really interesting because I think it's a kind of question that made me doubt my own hand and my own sensibility. And so it's a, it's a long process of actually coming back to trust one's own voice and to understand um, that it has a place, that it's actually what I make from. And weaving is an amazing thing. And everything I do is a woven response to the circumstances, as I said, of place, of weather, of political, social, architectural circumstances. And so I've been lucky to work in many different places um, and to think about the way in which I might weave the relationships between things because it's in the relationship between things in particular circumstances that things come to have meaning for us. So a voice might pass like a shuttle up through the five floors of a stone barn once used to store grain. A bell might pass through an exhibition everywhere and nowhere at once. A silk cloth surrounding two small temple bells. And it's the everywhere and nowhere at once that was the object of this. Every time it went down, it was different. It worked with gravity. And sometimes it made it to the bottom. <laughs> Technology um, and gravity. Uh, a singer winds a song up and down a tower and that is another weaving and another thread, connecting the water below to the sky above. A boat shaped like a shuttle is blessed by a thread held by many hands, is crossed by a figure whose path carries silence, is tethered to a boat of sound, and this boat made as part of the project The Quiet in the Land with Franz Moran now lives on the Mekong and um, there should be sound with this and it's last night we borrowed it back from the Sangha from Satu Ankeo and uh, the boat of silence was tethered to a boat of musicians and it was in that moment that the piece was live um And Satu Ankeo said to me, uh, silence and quiet is not something you need an architecture for. It's something you carry inside yourself. But he was still very happy, I think, to have this boat. And so I wanted to um, then talk a little bit more just about uh, some more recent projects. Uh, one of them at the armory um, in two and a half years ago, three years ago, was called The Event of the Thread. And that phrase, The Event of the Thread, comes from an entry that Annie Albers wrote to, I think, uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, she talks about that, the, that every cloth is the intersection of a thread. And so every cloth is full of contact and of crossings. And it's those crossings that are orchestrated that become the work. It's how I cross with the time I find myself. It's how materials cross with spaces and with other people. And how to make a weaving of that that invites people to participate um, in, as Rob said, as an active participant. Uh, so threads literally bound this, as did birds. So why read to a flock of pigeons in New York City? And why train them in a barn in Ohio where I live uh, to respond to the sound of a 
school bell and to hopefully fly to their food. Um, that, this was not always entirely successful. Maybe perhaps uh, you've had similar circumstances with your fireworks. <laughs> and to mail them to New York City, which is the only way that you can actually transport live animals legally. The birds, they come through the US mail. And to make a weaving or circumstance where people might we read to these pigeons as a way to actually reach across the distance um, to create in a, the enormous space of the armory a kind of intimacy, which is the intimacy of reading and being read to. And so the pigeons actually lived inside the armory, and they were surrounded by this landscape or this motion uh, of people in woven relation. And they uh, began at the end of the day, and I'll, or at the beginning of the day, I'll show you here. Well, let me describe this. Um, so there was a very large silk cloth that was not suspended by the architecture, but by the ropes that came off the swings. And so every person on every swing was connected up through pulleys to that cloth, to hold that cloth, and then on across to the swing on the other side. And so um, you could feel the weight of someone at a distance, farther than the reach of your hand or the call of your voice. And here you can see all the literal threads, so that while I might not be sitting at a loom at this point, it's the way that this piece is um, tied to the architecture that quite literally comes from that vocabulary and that way of thinking about the connectivity of textiles, threads, texts. Um, And there are the pigeons. So the species with um, that can be weightless is read to by the species that has weight and is not weightless, which is us. And uh, that voice was carried in pay, um, broadcast through a shortwave radio broadcast. And the receivers were small paper bags with uh, rechargeable radios in them so that at a distance, you could have the vibration and the intimacy of the voice on your chest. And at the end of the day, the pigeons, who never successfully figured out how to fly over that giant white cloth, um, were brought to the center, which was both an edge and a middle. And from there, at the end of the day, when um, after being serenaded by a vocalist, they flew to the other side. And um, this was my way, actually, of reading to New York City. And at the end of it, and this is always the way that a project actually um, gives you its own gift that is outside one's own intentionalities, is that uh, as, we, as the vocalist sang, this is Katie Geisinger that you hear, um, we, cut a live, we cut a live record. And when you cut an acetate record, um, this little needle carves the sound physically you know, into that material. What comes off is this spider web thin blue line. And it was when that happened in the process that I understood you know, the, that sound is how we touch at a distance. And that created the intimacy in this very enormous space and its um, civic history, which I was in many ways responding to. Stop. Okay. Stop. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh. okay, I'm going to say one thing, which is just only um, that this piece, like the piece that followed it actually in China this spring, I think one of the legacies of this piece for me is maybe none of the things that I've described briefly, but the fact that we opened the window onto Lexington Avenue. And so what happened is there was a spine that went through the entire piece. And that spine allowed for the first time a view in to what had always been 
really solid and inaccessible, you know, the facade of protection that the armory has been. And that was the thing that they decided then to incorporate into their permanent renovation. So while the pieces are ephemeral, sometimes some you don't know, you know, what it is that is left behind. And in this case, it's the invitation to come inside. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, sobering experience. This is what I would call um, to be in this uh, incredible panel. So, um, really, first of all, thank you very much to the Azure Society. Thank you, Michelle, for the invitation. And uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be sitting next to serendipitously, but I think there's a lot of serendipity involved in both of your practices, um, to be sitting next to two artists whom I've known and worshipped um, for many, many years, but never have I, th have I thought in my wildest dreams that I would be sitting on the same rug, on the same floor in front of this um, <laughs> audience. Well, we'll have dinner. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Let's continue to have dinner. What, obviously, um, the, the challenge of a situation like, like mine, because it, this, uh, there was no way to prepare for the unpreparable, um, I was thinking in my mind, and I called uh, Michelle in some kind of desperate call before this, and I said, who thought of inviting together Cy and Anne Hamilton? And he, her immediate answer was, it was Cy's idea. And I thought, what a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> the parallels, so I'm, not, I'm going to go straight mm -hmm. to the point. And what I found riveting, looking at your, both of your presentations, and this is only scratching the surface, in, in a very, very deep and dense oeuvre in both of your cases. Everybody knows this. But I, I'd like to throw in uh, a few um, key words, um, as, as Rob said at the end of his talk. I loved his talk, by the way. Um, but it's more like key um, oxymorons or paradoxes. It seems to me that you... you I love the, 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 the quote by Annie Albers of the event of the thread and how you both connect people, connect crowds, connect uh, societies even, connect cultures through threads, through ever so fragile, fragile events, materials, um, activities in one case or the other. Um, I could continue, but I, I wonder whether do you want to jump in and say something, either of you, or do you want me to give you a, a, a list of the others? <laughs> I continue. That's, uh, I was hoping you would not say. I was saying you should continue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I can tell you actually. Okay, okay. I keep running into Sai all over the world. Like, right? We will be. We were in uh, Buenos Aires. Yeah, in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Yeah, in Yeah, yeah. We're like, what are you doing here? Yeah. <laughs> and then we were in Wuzhen. Wuzhen. Yeah. yeah. And I'm walking across, yeah. and what are you doing here? Yeah. Yeah. So I know that, um, yeah. but you're working in such extraordinary scale yeah. that I think we really all wonder if you sleep or how do you how do you do this? <laughs> Indeed, we often bump into each other because we're like the birds um, who always fly to the same place at a specific season. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to start carrying your bag for you. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think the, 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 um, the thing that's been so extraordinary to me about your practice um, and an example is the way in which you have uh, found and made visible uh, a kind of material practice in a place that isn't necessarily visible. Right. So, of the other artists. Yeah. And the, I'm thinking about what you did in the Ukraine. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the invention, the, the flying machines, all, well, many projects. And um, I think about the, the generosity of that mm -hmm. as an artist. Mm -hmm. 
and um, also the, the respect for the kind of knowledge that is carried by these other practices. And that's, I think, one of the threads that um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. maybe in very different ways are a value that we both share. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you've just said another word which I think is absolutely key to, to both of your works, to both of your practices, and that's the, the term generosity. I think that you, you both place yourselves as individuals, and I love in the text that you wrote, uh, the text that we were all given, how you reread, by the way, uh, the history of Chinese art at the light of the, the major Western trope of individualism and where you say, you kind of question, uh, very interestingly in my, in my opinion, uh, the fast and simplistic Western read that we have of Chinese art as having deleted or having, having nothing to do with individualism. And you, you question this. And I, I think perhaps that's another possible crossroad because if you, if you take Anne's uh, practice, and I, if, if I say something that shocks you or you disagree sure with, you're going to scream. <laughs> but um, I, I find that perhaps Anne comes from the symmetric uh, perspective, that of a Western post-war American artist. Um, in my book, I find very interesting parallels with John Cage in your know, practice, mm-hmm. if I may say so. So John Cage also very interested in uh, the Orient in right. Eastern philosophy, Buddhism, as we know, since he studied Buddhism at Columbia University, was one of the first. And that, in a sense, Anne embodies uh, a very important uh, stride or effort within Western art where one uh, erases or attempts to erase the excess of individualism. So you return to a certain individualism from a, from a culture that doesn't have one. Mm-hmm. and. And perhaps yeah. uh, sort of tries to rectify an excess of individualism from the Western side. I don't know if you would agree on this. No? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So Anne just spoke and put some good words in me, and now uh, I want you to say some words. I once was also Anne's curator. Yeah. But there was once that in a project in Japan. So three years ago, three or so years ago, which was in 2012, actually. Mm -hmm. And then last year, um, which was 2015, when I went back to China and doing work in Japan. I went back to Japan, Niigata, for another exhibition of mine. Oh, I have to speak louder. Sorry. No, I think it's your mic. Right? I think so, it's it yeah. on. Oh, oh. So, the local peasants. Is it, is it better? Yeah. So, I went to Niigata local peasants all came to me asking, well, how is Anne now? It's as if I went to Niigata, local peasants all came to me asking, well, how is Anne now? It's as if Anne is my neighbor, and then I know everything about her. <laughs> So in my presentation, you saw lots of my um, spectacular projects. The, the, the mic. Uh, powerful. But actually, I also saw lots of um, striking, heart-striking projects in Anne's work. I was very impressed by the project where you use your finger to erase the text. Because in my practice, I use my hand to touch and caress the gunpowder when I create those drawings and paintings. As I touch the gunpowder, I can imagine and feel um, what will come after the ignition. And it's as if it was a conversation between me and the material. Just looking at the thread um, come going up and forth um, in, uh, around the paper that reminded me of the fuse in on my paper after ignition. Uh, 
可以把它连在一起的东西。I won't、um, go on continued elaborating on Anne's achievements because you already knew a lot about her.、Um, but I feel most strongly about Anne's work is、um, he's a, the the sense of time and temporality, and then the capacity to find the common threads to thread think various elements in our society and in mankind. 而且在这样的东西上面，像我啊，他在追求的一些东西，都是超越了东方和西方的问题。他是在。追求另外一种可能性。And in these aspects, which Anne and I share, I feel both of us have been pursuing something that transcends the,、um, the binary of East and West.、Mm. Rather,、um, it's more about、um, another pos- an alternate possibility. 对、mm. ，当然也包括东方西方，也包括他的故乡，我的故乡，他的亲人，我的亲人。It of course includes the East and the West, and then about、um, includes our hometown, our family.、Okay. I, th- I think there's another thing that、um, maybe your question and your response, and partly makes me think about that. It's this、um, kind of delicate orchestration or balance of near and far, and that、uh, you know、mm-hmm. the immediacy of something that you can experience, but it connects, and that far that it connects you you, you to whether that is、uh, t- a place in time、mm-hmm. or you know another、mm-hmm. continent. Uh, or uh, you know, space, sky, whatever, and that I think that that it's at this moment that what I see in the work is this very delicate、uh, presence of that embodies both the near and the far simultaneously, and maybe、um, I don't know. We could connect that to this sense of individuality in some way and、yeah. collectivity. Like, like, what does it mean to be a we?、Mm-hmm. You know, and like how we even think about that, so determined by our language.、Mm. Uh, this is exactly. I mean, you, I feel like you've said the, the next thing I was about to say and just wrote it up. But、no, this is. I was <laughs> reading your notes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, no, this is fascinating because I do believe that this is a, both、uh, another n- not or another very interesting.、Um, Opposition, perhaps, of notions that you tie together, like one could say, one t- from one to the infinite.、Mm-hmm. There's this notion of the the infra min infra thin, as Duchamp called this. You know, the the, the the scale of the dust to to the universe. And I think both of you, in some ways that I could not、uh, barely imaginable, you 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 connect those unconnectables. And I find this absolutely fascinating.、Uh, Anne was using an exp- is my is my mic okay? Yeah. Um, uh, Anne was using that connection in the great little film that we saw, the, 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 the presentation, connecting the water between and the sky above.、And、that's also something that could、mm-hmm. almost apply word for word for、mm-hmm. science practice.、Mm-hmm. Um, but could, one could go on and on. I think I find that this、uh, relation, you, you, you both, in a way, manage to bring the scale of the universe to a scale of intimacy. That is,、ah. I think, fascinating.、Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think there's, a, there's. I mean, I think there's another thing too that's really important to talk about because I think,、um, Sai, in your practice, you're very interested in collaborating with institutions to make condition, like a, make a bigger condition. And I'm thinking about what Rob said about institutional、uh, works and the the work and the, that institutions are doing that is very different from the market,、mm-hmm. and that、uh, and 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 how it's a place we're making and another set of questions. Is really happening. I don't know if you want to speak from the audience, <laughs> from there. but、uh, I, I think that、uh, you have worked in and out of institutions in a really particular way. Like you've made this practice, or you formed it to work for what your practice needs, instead of to like fit the practice inside the structure. Yeah, right. And I think、yeah. that's something that. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Okay. That also is like my own time space. Art for me is like my time space channel for me. In certain way. Yeah. So I myself am not. I 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 am not. Just like when I、uh, a project in Iwaki. It was a small city next to the sea in Fukuoka. They were always helping me. 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 They were
the local residents in Iwaki has been helping me realize my art. 对，我就不说那个历史。I, I grew up in,、uh, I stayed in Japan and developed、uh, for eight years or so. 后来 developed my art there. 后来他们那个福岛放射线和海啸以后。And then after the nuclear disaster following the Japan earthquake. 我就刚好我就卖了画，拍卖画。I, I auctioned one of my painting the market to the to use the pro, pro, apply the proceeds to the charity cause. 我希望他们赶快建房子、啊。So I hope the local people can rebuild their houses, which were torn down in the nuclear disaster. 但他们说他们要做种樱花。But they told me they want to plant cherry blossom trees. 嗯，他们说他们这个樱花。嗯是这个放射线，这个核电站都是他们的责任，留给后代。他们要把这些地方种上烟花，让从天空看起来是粉红的。Because they feel、um, the nuclear disaster was they were to blame for the nuclear disaster, so they want to plant cherry blossom trees on their、uh, homeland, in their homeland on the mountains. So in the future, people will see the mountain covered with the blonde, cher- pink cherry blossom. 那他们打算做四万棵，种四万棵。Uh, they told me they want to plant ten mil, uh, ten thousand. But I was always back to help them. And I came back again and again to help them. Of course, it's almost impossible to plant really ten thousand cherry blossom trees. Well, of course, it's almost impossible to plant really ten thousand cherry blossom trees. The most important is to convey a message, concept. So I bought a 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 concept. A museum meandering under the cherry blossom trees. Let these children love their own homeland. To make the local kids love their town even more. It also became a place for the museum. Also became a place for them to do exhibitions. Also inviting artists from outside to come and to have more art,、um, art projects with the local people. But the main thing I want to say is that we always want to be open to all kinds of people. We have to open ourselves up and to try to、um, be just like them. Yeah, this is again. Amazing. Yeah, please. Yeah. 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 This is this is absolutely amazing. I I was,、uh, I feel like I'm almost you know in one of these boats that either of you would have an installation. I, I almost have nothing to do. <laughs> <and it's> just, <laughs> I was, by, by the way, the, the installation. I was one once、uh, a, pr- a professor in, at Osaka University in,、mm. in Japan, and I was invited by the dean to participate in a Shinto festival.、Yeah. And you know what they they like the, the, those boats in utter silence, and then occasionally when one of the shrines passes by, you just hear this gong and this like、mm. that silence that reverberates、mm. through throughout your 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 whole bodies. Indescribable, but anyway, I was about to bring up the the notion of the connection. The, the uh, actually, uh, Anne made that、uh, metaphor of weaving as a link between things, as a link between human beings, link between societies. Re- starting going back to the notion of regenerosity, which we were talking about before, it seems to me that there's a very、uh, inherent social dimension to both of your practices in a in a really huge way, and it's not just、uh, an artifice; it's a very profound, that's my perception, very deeply felt、uh, engagement in each of your position, and I find this extremely remarkable,、mm-hmm. admirable, and. And and thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.